All right, here we go. Oop. That's not what I wanted. All right. Um, as as far as our um, uh, review from yesterday, we're looking at the patterns <clears throat> of all the messages of the seven churches. We talked about Ephesus yesterday. Today, we're going to talk about Smyrna and Pergamum. But we we talked about that there's a pattern on all the churches. Now, not all the churches have all of these seven, but... Um, the, the there there seems to be a, a pattern on Jesus addressing the problems of the churches. The first thing is he addresses the angel of the church, and we talked about how uh, each church has its own angel, each church has its own messenger, and it seems to me that there's a hierarchy of people that that, that God uh, commands to protect uh, and teach a church. The, then the second is the description of Jesus. Jesus describes himself to each of the churches, and all of those descriptions are found in chapter one, but they're interspersed in the book in, in the next seven uh, churches. And the biggest reason for that is it seems to me that not one church can actually have all the characteristics of Jesus because it's too big. And we're too frail. And so it seems to me that even in the seven churches, Jesus is um, is shown to the world through the different churches. Um, the other thing is there's this affirmation, I know. And this I know is not so much intellectual. The, the Greek for this is uh, the, the same thing as I'm intimate with you. It's the same word that um the that is used for uh intimacy or a sexual relationship so god basically is saying i know you i know you intimately i know your struggles and then there's the censure god doesn't seem to be a god that uh, actually just says positive things if there's negative things to talk about because love is about sharing with people some of the most uncomfortable conversations. And there are some really uncomfortable uh, um, yeah, uncomfortable conversations in the churches. And then there's the admonition and the promise of reward. And then there's the appeal to listen to the churches. We talked about how some one of the patterns in, also in the churches is that there's a decline in the churches. The first church there is a church that's madly in love with Jesus, and they lost that first love. That was the first church. But by the time we get to the seventh church, um, one of the censures in in uh, in the um, uh, in, in the churches was that uh, they were lukewarm, and because of that, God wanted to vomit them out of His mouth. So we get from a church who's madly in love with Jesus. And by the time we get to the seventh churches, the seventh church, at this point, God is, um, is just wants to vomit them. They, they are that, uh, they are that repulsive to Jesus. But that doesn't mean that Jesus loves them less, because it seems to me that as the churches get worse, the promise or the reward gets more. It seems to me that Jesus is not scared of declining churches. He doesn't panic when his churches get worse, or he doesn't panic when his churches decline. If anything, he gives them more grace. That, again, is why Jesus is the star of Revelation. We begin to find out that without Jesus, there is no chance for the world. There is no chance for his church. And I, I believe that's a message that all of us need to hear. I believe that message brings us so much hope. Because I don't know about you, but there are many times in life where we realize that we're broken beyond repair. 
I don't know if you notice that maybe our world is broken beyond repair. Maybe our country is broken beyond repair. Maybe you are part of families that seems to be broken beyond repair. The greatest hope that you can have, that all of us can have, is that this same Jesus has his churches in the hollow of his hand, and he is in the midst of all of them. So I'm going to talk about Smyrna. Smyrna is known as the persecuted church. Now, it is important to know that even though when we look at this from the historical point of view, we look at these churches as different eras of, in, in the history from the time of John all the, all the way till the time Jesus comes. But during that time, these churches were all, these churches all existed at the same time. But what's interesting is even though Smyrna is about 100 miles away from Ephesus, their problems are very, very different. The people in Ephesus did not um, experience the same persecution that the church in Smyrna did. And so uh, some scholars would put the era, especially those scholars who look at this in a historical point of view, Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the four different ways that uh, the relation is interpreted. I'm interpreting this from the historical point of view. I, I Again, I don't want to uh, get into it today. We will get into it tomorrow. But most, uh, m most scholars who, who interpret Revelation from the historical point of view would put Smyrna on the era of the church from A.D. 100, to 313. And when I say the era of the church, the, the Christian church, it's interesting how the Christian church changes throughout history. And, and Revelation actually brings out the challenges of the Christian church throughout history. And so I want to talk a little bit, though, about the church, the issues in the church of Smyrna. The biggest issue for me in the Church of Smyrna is how can God be good and yet have bad things happen in an evil world? One of the, th uh, as a pastor, one of the biggest reasons why people uh, go away from Christianity, these are the things I hear many times. Um, I have a friend who says, I don't want to follow God because. Um, I can't believe he would let children be molested. What kind of God would just stand uh, and do nothing when children are molested? I, I don't want to have anything to do with that kind of God. Um, when good things, when bad things happen to good people, it definitely shakes um, our trust in God, or many people's trust in God. And they ask questions like, did God create evil? And if things went wrong, why didn't God do anything to put them, the, to put them right again? Why do so many good people have problems while so many evil people prosper? These questions, I, I think the Bible doesn't shy away from any of them. I'm not going to go, the, the, this is a story of, uh, and we're going to go through prophecy in the, book of, uh, in the book of Revelation on the church of Smyrna, but I believe Smyrna answers these questions just a little bit. Um, see, different approaches to the problem of suffering, it's not a problem for atheists. For atheists, they believe that everything is by chance anyway. So it's just bad luck. Just suck it up and take it. The problem with people who believe in God is they believe that God is in control of everything and that he's an all-powerful God and he loves us. So how can a, he, and, and so people sometimes uh, separate the thing and says God can be powerful, he can be all-powerful, but he can't be that loving and let bad things happen to good people. Or he's all-loving, but there are just some things he can't do. But I don't think... As we, as we look at the book of Revelation, we will find out that God does allow bad things to ha happen to people, but there's always a reason for it. 
And it seems to me that the people who trust him the most actually are okay when bad things happen to them. That, to me, is the story of Smyrna. So as you can see, Smyrna, again, is about 100 miles north of Ephesus. And if you look at this, uh, it, it seems to me that when the seven churches, the messages to the seven churches was made by John, it was made so that uh, it, it's made on a trail route or a mail route. So it, um, it, it seemed that he had in his mind that the letter would first be read to the people in Ephesus, then it would be read to the people of Smyrna, then it would be read to the people of Pergamum. And, and so there's an order to this whole thing. But as we will study more about tomorrow, the chiasm of this is, is not at all uh, in order. Because they seem to be struggling with different things that the whole history of the Christian church would struggle with throughout time. These weren't the only seven churches in Smyrna. Uh, I'm sorry. This weren't the only seven churches in uh, Turkey at that time. Obviously, we know there's a church in Jerusalem. Right in between uh, Sardis and Philadelphia is the city of Colossus. There was a church in Colossus, and we know that because uh, Paul wrote a letter to the people of the Colossians. And so we so this is all about getting a message out. There are more than seven churches, but God chose seven because there is a symbolic uh, there. There's a, a seven is a symbol of completeness. And so when God wanted to get the, the, the message out to the churches at that time, he also wanted to get get a message out to the people living at the end time, because remember in, in chapter 1 of Revelation, the reason why um, John or the, the angel spoke to John and gave the message of Revelation is because it says the time is near. The message of the book of Revelation is all for people back then, but it's also for people living at the end time. So let's let's try to figure out this tension, shall we? And again, this is the time when if you have any questions, please write them down, and then uh, we can talk about it tomorrow. But as uh, one of our listeners said, I don't even know what questions to ask, because I'm not sure I'm getting anything. And so like, just come on on Sunday. Let's talk about it on Sunday. And so if at this point, there's a, a lot of confusion in what we're going through, I hope to see you all tomorrow. This is what Smyrna looks like today. It is actually a city block. And we see that uh, the, the ones that they actually um, unearthed or uh, did archaeolog archaeological digs in is the marketplace. So this is kind of what the marketplace looks like. Um, and this is what the city of Smyrna looks like. This picture was taken because they took us to a park in um, on a mountain overlooking the city. It's a beautiful city. It is a city that um, that has the second most population, only second to Istanbul in, in all of Turkey. Now, the other thing about Smyrna is that it, this is called the persecuted church. Everyone in Smyrna actually um, experienced persecution. One of the martyrs there is Polycarp. He was martyred on 156 AD because during this time, uh, emperor worship was being enforced by law. And as a Christian at that time, he refused to offer worship to Caesar. And the way he refused is he refused to bow down to an idol of Caesar, and he refused to offer incense to an idol of Caesar. Well, he went into hiding. He was taken from his hiding place, and he made no effort to resist. He offered his uh, captors the last food and drink that he had, and then asked for time to pray. And uh, history tells us that he prayed for two hours. If you know, that the decision you're going to make will be one of the last decisions you'll make. 
What would you do? For Polycarp, it's to pray. And for him, praying, I, I, I don't even know what he asked for. I don't know if he begged for his life or did he beg that his soul would be ready for Jesus coming. And then, they again, right before they were about to burn him at the stake, they asked him, swear by the genius of Caesar, and we will release you. Offer this incense by the genius of Caesar, and we will release you. And this is what he replied. For 86 years, I have served this God, and he has never done anything wrong to me. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? And so at that point, they gathered some uh, a pile of wood. They, uh, they actually was going to uh, tie him to the stake. And he says, no, you don't need to tie me. I'm not going to run away. And so he stood there without any uh, w- without anything binding him. And this is the thing. His captors actually respected him. By the way, this is why Christianity spread so much during the time of uh, the Ephesus church. is because even though people would disagree with the beliefs of the Christians at that time, everybody was sure that these Christians believed all this. Uh, they, they believed in their God with all their heart, soul, and mind. And these are the things that inspired even their captors. It says the fire was lit, but the wind blew the flames, which means that the flames did not um, consume Polycarp. In fact, it made his suffering more that one of the soldiers who couldn't stand the guy suffering actually took his sword and just speared him with it. And so what the Christians did was fleed the different cities that persecuted them. And one of the cities was Smyrna. And one of the places they went to, again, is is part of Turkey, is Cappadocia. Some of the the pictures that I'm about to show you are places in Cappadocia. Now, the, 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 the very unique thing in Cappadocia is they have these mountains or these little hills that you can actually... Um, uh, it is, you can like actually make little cave things out of it. In fact, there are things that are made like a cave. Uh, this valley is known where a lot of Christians were. They were saying that over 3,000 Christians were actually living at this place at one time. And so when you get into some of these caves, now some of you who are actually on, um, you have uh, these same pictures because you've been there. Um you can actually go inside of those. I, I don't know. You can actually see somebody over here wanting to take a picture while uh, while they were in one of these openings. When you get inside these openings, you will actually see places where people lived. Now, all of this actually uh, came as a, a surprise when one day um, one of the farmers who actually had a barn and the floor of his barn was uh, crumbling, and he was wondering what in the world was going on. And so he, he kind of dug around where the floor was crumbling, and all of a sudden he saw uh, just a lot of passageways, and this is how many of these things were discovered. Um, this uh, is um, a place where an, there was an opening, and you see stones that they can roll into the opening. So if they can get in, they roll the, they roll the stones in, and nobody can get in or out. But when you get into these cave-like things, you begin to see there are there uh, there's a city inside of them, and uh, they this is a picture where there's an altar. So they had church services. They even had things uh, like Mm -hmm. um, baptism, baptismal. uh, uh, Where where they had baptism, (laughs) Um, and, and so. This is how we know that Christians were living in these places. Now, what happened was a Roman soldier found them out and actually became a spy. And so they told the Roman governor or they they told the Roman legion where these people are. And basically, 
Uh, all the Christians died when an army came, and even though they couldn't see them, what they did was they built a fire in the entrances of all these places, and so everybody died inside uh, smoke inhalation or just uh, uh, the uh, they just died because they they couldn't breathe anymore because of the fires that were built by the Romans. But that's part of the history uh, that happened from AD 100 all the way to AD 300. There's multiple uh, cities all over Asia where the Roman governor or the, the, the Roman legions, the, the, Roman, uh, the, the Roman leaders were trying to kill the Christians because they accused the Christians of being atheists, of all things. And they accused the, 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 um, the Christians of being atheists because they only worshipped one God. So in their minds, there's multiple, of, multiple gods. And if you're just going to concentrate on one God, then you must be an atheist. Uh, this, uh, this Smyrna was the first city in Asia to erect a temple the worship of the Roman emperor. And the other thing too, though, there are other, uh, the, the other people who were persecuting the Christians were the Jews. They incited persecution of Christians. Now, the interesting part was, even for some of the Romans during this time, they allowed the Jews to worship because of political reasons. But Christians were looked at with suspicion. And so if the Romans looked at you with suspicion and the Jews looked at you with suspicion in a place where the biggest, uh, the, the, the biggest religions were paganism by the Romans and uh, the, Jew, the Jewish religion, then you really had nowhere to hide. In fact, the Jews accused Christians of cannibalism because they, they accused them of having to eat and drink the body of Jesus Christ. And so it's in this setting, and it's in this backdrop, that Jesus describes himself as the first and the last, the one who died and came to life again. Why do you think this would be so important? To the people of Smyrna. Can you imagine? Here you are in this dungy, dark room somewhere out in the mountains of Cappadocia. And then somebody reads you this letter and says, Did you know that John uh, got a message from none other than Jesus? And Jesus mentioned your church by name. And Jesus introduced himself to you <laughs> as the first and the last who died and came to life again. I believe there were some tears that were shed when this letter was read. Because Jesus tell is telling them, yeah, I know all the people that died because of me. I, I, I was there when Polycarp died. He was praying to me the whole time. I heard his prayer. I was talking to him. And my message to him is, I'm the first and the last. I did die, just like you died, but I have come to life again. Just like if you have faith in me, you will also come to life again. He says, I know your poverty. I'm very intimately acquainted with your poverty. And the Greek word is tokea, which uh, this is like beggars. You're destitute to the point of being homeless. You do not know where you're going to get your next meal. And if you're living in caves, you literally are homeless. And God says, I am intimately aware of the uh, struggles that you go through. I am intimately aware of the hardships that you're going through because you decided to become faithful to me. The Apostle Paul 
tells us this in um, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. No, 8, verse 9. He says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. See, God understood that literally they were poor, but spiritually they are rich. And by the way, this is a question that I think all of us will have to struggle with, especially those of us who are living in America. If God ever gave us a choice, I'll give you anything you want. I can either give you richness but you will be poverty, uh, you will be in poverty spiritually, or I can give you, you will be poverty physically, but you will be rich spiritually. Which one would you choose? I know for me, I'm ashamed to say it's a tough choice. And that's why I'm so glad that God is the one who chooses for me. <laughs> Because if I had my choice, I would love to be a multimillionaire, billionaire. And I only admit that because I, I, I realize that I, I actually don't. But, you know, I, 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 I wonder what it's like to, to have life, to, to, to live a life where whatever you want to buy, you can buy. There are no budgets. I wonder what I would do with a kind of life like that. And the sad thing is, I think that's what most people are going for. I would even dare say that most people can't attend this meeting because they're so busy trying to get all kinds of stuff. And that is why they are rich in things. But when it comes to spiritual things, they are so poor. When it comes to faith in God, they're so poor. They get discouraged by the littlest of things. Jesus, as our leader, showed us that he gave all the riches of heaven to, became, to become poor so he can save us. And when he calls on his followers to do the same thing, to give up things for his name, what they get in return is a relationship with God that is second to none. They get to see things through God's eyes. They wake up every day not knowing where their food comes from, but they're always in a buffet of God's spiritual blessing. I want to challenge all of us. I say us because I'm, I'm challenging myself today too. I, in, in fact, right now, I'm praying, Lord, help me to to have the wisdom to turn away from the riches of the world and accept the richness of your grace. Help me to not be distracted by the riches of the world, but want the riches of your grace. Because you know what? God may not give us the riches of this world. He loves us too much many times to give us the riches of the world, but he will lavish his love and his grace on us. So that even when we are poor, we can be rich. He says, this is his affirmation. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. And then he says, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. See, that's the thing about Revelation. It never minces any words. Who are these Jews? But they are not. And they are a synagogue of Satan. One of the things that the, the book of Revelation will bring out is that not every church is a church of God. Not everyone who says, I'm following God, actually is following God. And by the way, Jesus himself said that, right? He says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is my follower. And even when, when Peter was saying, Lord, you're not going to die. Do you remember what Jesus said? Get thee behind me, Satan. I, I think that hurt Peter a little bit. I think that hurt Peter a lot. 
But Jesus was understanding that not every person who's friendly to you is your friend. And not per every person who will actually say some things that you don't want to hear is your enemy. And Jesus says, I know that there are some Jews who claim to be worshiping me, but they're the synagogue of Satan. And by the way, this is not new. Remember when Jesus was talking to some of the Jews when he was here on earth, he actually said, you say, you're father of Moses? Moses is not your father. The devil is your father because you are a liar just like he is. This is what his advice is. Remember, this is one of the churches that doesn't have any censures. Jesus could not find anything wrong with this church. He says, do not be afraid of you're about to suffer. Because I don't know about you. I'm afraid of needles. So there is this, there is this thing of when I'm about to suffer, there's this fear that comes, that overwhelms me sometimes. Jesus says, I know, you know, that you're about to suffer. You're about to give up things that are important to you for my sake, because I'm more important to you than those things. He says, don't be afraid of them. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Where does this 10 days come from? Do you remember anywhere in the Old Testament where people were tested for 10 days? Daniel and his three friends were tested for 10 days. <clears throat> and their life was also on the line. Jesus compares the people of Smyrna to Daniel and his three friends. It also tells us that the test doesn't come from Jesus. It comes from the devil. Now, some of us might say, uh-oh, why would God even allow any test to come from the devil? I'm not sure I can tell you why Jesus does anything. All I know is this. Jesus can even uh, use the, what, the, the devil's worst um, weapons against you for his kingdom, for his good. Whenever Jesus says yes to whatever the devil wants to do for us, to us, there's always something good that will come out of it. Just like with Daniel, after they passed the test, they became the wisest people in all the land. Could it possibly be that because the people of Smyrna who passed this test, became the richest people of all the land. And this is the thing, the only way we will find out how rich they are is in heaven. I don't think any of these people, I think people were laughing at them. I think people were, were, were looking at them like, these guys are absolutely nuts. But someday up in heaven, I believe, God is going to show us the riches of these people who decided to give up earthly things so they can experience heavenly things. And he says, be faithful even unto death. And he says, I will give you life as your victor's crown. I will give you a victor's crown. Wait, you're about to experience death. What is this life? Obviously, it's not about life that's breathing. It's about something else so much better. And the only people who experience this kind of life are the people who give their life to God. This whole victor's crown, Stephanos, is what they give, uh, they, they give to people who finish races. And when the person becomes the winner of a race, there is a celebration. The whole city celebrates them. And a crown is put on their head. I believe Jesus wanted to tell the Smyrnans and people anywhere in the world who give everything to God. I'm going to give you this crown. And yes, the whole city of the new Jerusalem, all my creatures that I created is going to give you a standing ovation for finishing strong. And so we have this again, whoever has ears, 
Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then we have two rewards. The one who's victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. And again, the question would be asked, what is the second death? The second death is not mentioned until Revelation 20. So I'm going to have to wait to explain this on Revelation 20. But this is the thing. Anyone who tried to teach us that there is no death, Bible actually teaches us, yeah, there is not only one death, there's also the second death. And it seems to me that this, you will not be hurt by the second death, is a positive thing. It's a reward. And I believe that all the people that read this understood what the second death was all about. They've been taught what the second death was all about. If you stay with us throughout this Revelation seminar, I believe we will actually also learn what this second death is about. And this is the first time you're hearing it. I would like to invite you to come with, uh, to come be with us uh, as we go through this lesson. See, the origin of suffering, the Bible lays the blame at one person who fell from heaven. It lays the blame only in Satan. When you know, when you see pictures like this, man walking on fire. I think this is one of the evidences that there's evil in the world around us. And many times it wows us. This is not normal. This isn't somebody who has bigger calluses on his feet. This isn't somebody who actually has his mind over matter type of a thing. There's a certain power that allows people to do things like this. And this is the thing. God gives us sufficient evidence to believe, but never removes all cause for doubt. We really need to have the faith and trust of a child. That with all the evil that we see in the world today, we have a God who's in control of the world of evil. That somehow in the tension where Satan is evident, there's also a tension that God is evident. And somehow God in his wisdom understands that he can give us evidence that he is real, that he is powerful, and that he is loving, but he leaves us an out if we want to. Because there will be people who will never want to believe in God, no matter how much evidence they have. Moving on to the next church, we go move on to the church of Pergamum, the compromising church. This church is from AD 13 to 538. Um, emperor Trajan uh, uh, was the emperor during the, this time, and this is a statue. This is his statue. Uh, Pergamum is probably the most impressive of all the seven churches. It is impressive in the way it's built. It is impressive in the ruins that's left of it all. If you visit Pergamum today, you will actually see two parts of Pergamum. I kind of put these two parts in this picture. The one that's the small picture to your left is the, the lower part of Pergamum, and it's overlooking the upper part of Pergamum. On the upper part of Pergamum, you have temples. And uh, the, 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 the temples of Zeus, this is the temple of Zeus, and the temple of um oh, forgetting it's the snake god uh, asclepius uh, asclepius and the 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 city actually has two theaters so it seems to me that the people of pergamum also loved entertainment this is one of their uh cities and it's dedicated to aspecleos aspecleos is this uh, this snake god. I, I took a picture of this because, um, I, you know, we had a doctor with us when we went there. And as soon as he saw this picture, he says, you know what? That is an emblem for the medical field. And 
the, it, it is a snake that's somewhat curling uh, up a pole. And it, it, is, it is because that it is in Pergamum that actually has hospitals that was built there. But it, it kind of, even when I was hearing about it, just kind of gave me the chills that there used to be a time when people were worshiping the snake god, all because we all know who the snake is, right? It was, this is devil worship at its most boastful way. Nobody's hiding anything here. We're worshiping the devil. Uh, also, at, at, at the hospitals, they have this, they call healing springs, and people would line up to this sacred water. And by the way, this water never stops uh, never stops going out. Uh, even when we were there, there were people who decided to, you know, they, they needed some healing. And so they were putting this water on their, uh, on their hands and then putting it all over their face and all over their bodies. Because even today, there are people who believe that there are sacred qualities, healing qualities in this water. This is what the hospital looks like today. And as you can see, this is the upper city that's overlooking the lower city. In this, uh, in this city is the altar of Zeus. And this altar of Zeus actually looks like this. This is in the uh, this is in the museum in Germany. Uh, what we see on on there is just the. Um, uh, the ruins of it all. And every time, people from all over Turkey, people from all over the world during the time of Pergamum would come to this city to worship Zeus and Asplecius, the snake god. This is what it would look like today if it was still... Um, if it was still built, if it wasn't in ruins. Um, this is the lower city. The, uh, the temple of Zeus is in the top part of the city. And the temple of Aspeclius and the hospital of Aspeclius is also in the lower city. This is what a model would look like of what Pergamum would look like today. It is an amazing city. Even if it's in ruins, you're you're just like, man, how this must have been incredible when it was at its height. This is what the Roman theater. So it had two theaters. This is the Roman theater, which could sit up to 15,000. And the lower theater is what we showed in the earlier slide. This is one of the mosaics or picture. And so this is some of the, one of the pictures that was shown. Because this is Constantine. Um, as he talks about his conversion story, and his conversion story is there's a cross and then the sun god. So as you begin to see, this is where the merging of paganism and Christianity starts coming to play. This is a mosaic where Christ as Helius, the sun god, was ascending to heaven. So now Christ becomes Helius, Christ becomes the sun god. And this was in a mosaic, in a church, in Pergamon. So even at this point, uh, whether it be later on or during the time Pergamon was, was, was there, there definitely was a merging of truth and error. Pergamon was a center of intellectual life in Asia. Its library had 200,000 scrolls because this is a time when the start of parchment was being introduced to Asia. Polytheism with multiple temples to many gods was uh, the main thing in this, in this city. Asclepios, the god of medicine and healing, and also Zeus. Buildings were made of black stone. They were made of white marble inscriptions attached in some places. And, and uh, they were offering incense that say that Caesar is Lord. And they do this annually. Oh, sorry. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I was hitting the wrong thing. Now, all of this is actually part of the message to the people of Pergamum. That when they read the letter that was that was given to them, they're like, man, this is actually in tune with our culture. So Jesus, look at his description. He comes to them as, uh, as a person with a sharp double-edged sword. Now, this description we see in the book of Hebrews. Now, what is the double-edged sword in the book of Hebrews? It is the word of God. Now, as, as we saw in the last slide, uh, the, the governor would actually come out with a two-edged sword in, in some of their, uh, their parades twice a year. And then he uh, also introduces himself as someone who knows. Again, the I know is I'm very intimately, uh, I have intimate knowledge of the fact that you live where Satan has his throne. He said, I, I was there uh, twice, at, even, even at its ruins. Jesus calls the altar of Zeus and the altar of Asclepius, Asclepius as a throne of Satan. <clears throat> I wonder if you feel like you live in a city where Satan has his throne. What would that look like? I have some friends who decide to build churches in the middle of gang-infested places. I know some missionaries who built schools in the middle of pagan practice, uh, in the middle of Muslim cities. And people were trying to kill them. I believe that it's not only Pergamum who experience who experiences where God's people live, where Satan has his throne. And his affirmation was, even though you live in these places, you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me. Not even in the days of Antipas. Now, who, who is this Antipas? Um, Antipas was a person who was put to death. No one is sure who he is, but his name is pretty interesting because it means against everyone. That's what Antipas means. Antipas seems to be a person who, like Polycarp, had to give up his life because he believed in, in God and he did not want to follow the practices of um, uh, the, the practices of uh, the, the pagans. He was a faithful witness who was put to death in your city, he says, where Satan lives. So even in Pergamum, there was persecution. This is the biggest difference. This, this uh, city has one of the biggest critiques or censures. First of all, it says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols. Now you will see uh, Balaam's story in the book of Numbers. And uh, uh, again, if I can summarize this story, Balak was a king who got scared that the Israelites were near his kingdom. So he decided to hire Balaam because he knew that Balaam was a prophet of the living God. He was a prophet for Israel. And Balaam decided, sure, I'll work for you. 
And Balak was saying, I'm going to give you all this money if you curse Israel. The problem was Balaam could not curse Israel, no matter how much he tried. It, it, one of the most popular parts of the story was he was riding his donkey to on his way to curse Israel. And the donkey started talking because the angel of the Lord with his sword drawn stop uh was right in front of the donkey and the donkey refused to to move and and Balaam got out and just started beating the donkey merciful mercilessly and then the donkey started saying why are you beating me and Balaam started talking to the donkey i don't know why but he started talking to the donkey and says it's because why are you not obeying me at this time and at that point, he looked up and saw the angel. Now, you would think that the story would end there. Balaam would just go home and says, forget it. I don't ever want to do this. But he goes to Balak. And, and the story ends with him telling Balak, look, I can't. I can't curse Israel. I, even if I try, the words that come out isn't a curse. But I know what you could do. You can invite all the single men to go in many of your... Uh, your festivals and you know just bring the most beautiful out women out to them and if they worship your god god will destroy them and that's what they did so this whole thing about some of among you who hold to the teaching of balaam what he's talking about was there were people who were in uh, who believed in paganism, didn't really believe much in God, who was trying to entice the Christians to get out to worshiping God and worship Zeus or Asclepius. This sin of food sacrifice to idols and committing sexual immorality, all of this is all about worship. Remember in the New Testament, uh, Paul actually says, there's nothing wrong with, with eating food sacrificed to idols. The problem with this is that they were eating food sacrificed to idols in the temple of paganism. The, the eating of the food sacrificed to idols and having uh, sex with the, the, um, with the prostitutes of uh, the, 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 the pagan um, temples, all of that is part of worship. And says, likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And again, because of time, we talked about the Nicolaitans last night, so I'm not going to go through that. So his advice is repent. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And so he was saying, look, you need to get out of trying to worship me and other gods. You have to make your choice. You either worship me or them. Don't try to make it both. And so you have, even back then, you have churches who do not worship God faithfully. You have Christians who are Christians by name only. But they aren't Jesus worshipers or they aren't Jesus followers. But they claim to be. And the thing is, somehow Satan uses them to entice other people who are trying to serve God faithfully to give up serving God faithfully. And I'm guessing that some of the words they say is, you don't have to be so serious about worshiping God. Surely you can go worship God on Sabbath, but come with us on other days. You don't have, I mean, just, just you know, have two faces, so to speak. You can, you can be with your Christian friends, but after a while, come with us. There's nothing wrong with what we're doing. And look, you can actually know more people. Maybe they'll even come up with, you can actually see more pagans. See, we're only hanging out with all these pagans, doing everything that they do so that we can someday, you know, kind of bring them to church someday. And Jesus rebukes them for listening 
to those kinds of temptations, listening to that kind of garbage. And so basically, here we go again. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious. What this tells me is that there are people in the church who will not be victorious. But there will be some who will. This is what happens when God's word and God's gospel is spread throughout the world. There will be people who will listen, and then there will be people who won't. This is what happens even with people who listen. It says, I will do what God tells me to do. There will be some who will be victorious, and then there will be some who don't, who won't be victorious. And the biggest difference is, is because the people who are victorious are the ones who listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The ones who aren't are the ones who don't. And these are the rewards. Now, this is the third church. We see that there are three new rewards that comes out. So again, it seems to me that one of the biggest points of the seven churches is as the seven churches get worse and worse, God's grace seemed to increase. The one who's victorious, I will give him some of the hidden manna. What is in the world is the hidden manna. Well, again, you would need to know about the sanctuary to understand what's this hidden manna. Because this hidden manna is actually in a bowl. And this manna was picked straight from the outside and hid in the Ark of the Covenant. It is a manna that never spoils. It doesn't get changed. It is supernaturally kept in the um, Ark of the Covenant. When God says, I will give some of the hidden manna, what he's saying is, I will give you food directly from the throne. Because that's what the Ark of the Covenant stands for. I will be the one that will give you peace directly from the throne. I will give you spiritually food directly from me. That is what this hidden manna is all about. And is I will give that person a white stone. Because at that point, I remember the all the temples were made out of black stones or white stones. But the other thing during this time is when there was a court case, when somebody was proven guilty, they get a black stone. When somebody was proven, in it, proven innocent, they get a white, white stone. And so God says, I'll give you a white stone. I will forgive your sin. And in that white stone, it says, you will have a new name. Known only to the one who receives it. Why is it known only to the one who receives it? By the way, back then, names were not just given to some people so that they can you know, be called something. Names always meant Something There was always a meaning to name. When Jesus was given his name, he was given the name Jesus, according to the New Testament, for he will save people from their sins. Jesus means Savior. Every person in the New Testament, Jacob, had to have his name changed because his name uh, that was given him as a deceiver. His name was now changed to Israel as the father of many nations. Jesus says, all of us who become victorious, we're all going to get a new name. When I get to heaven, I believe my name is not Frendel. My mom and dad gave me a name I love, but somehow God is going to give me a new name that will have the history of my life here on earth of when I gave my life to him. And all throughout eternity, that's going to be my new name. You will also have a new name, which is going to reflect your faithfulness to God through the many things that come your way. These are all great rewards. And so as we come to our second church, as we end uh, with the second church, we begin to see that even now we get to see how the churches are starting to struggle with truth. 
we begin to see how Satan is attacking the church. The first church, he attacks them by having them take for granted the things that they fell in love with. The second church, he tries to kill every single one of them. And the third church, he just decides to have them compromise with the world around them. Do you think all these things aren't happening today? See, I believe that when people read the message of the seven churches, I believe God uses the same things that he gives to the seven churches to give us the same messages that he used to give back then. And if I'm going to summarize the message, keep listening to the Holy Spirit. And there's a great reward for any time you choose me over the world. So today, the question is, who will you choose? And I would like to quote one of my favorite quotes from Joshua. Choose you this day, who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for letting us know that Satan's temptations are not new. That we are never alone. That we're a part of a history of faithful people who have gone through so many things where Satan has tried to take away our faith from him. I pray, Lord, that with everything that we learn today, we will also learn that you have also made your stand that you have also used all these things that Satan puts in our way to show us that you're more powerful than him. So help us, Lord, to choose you in everything we do. And I thank you that you have answered our prayer because we ask it all in thy holy and wonderful name. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who, um, we, we hope to see you tomorrow. Again, tomorrow yes. we're going to go through any of the texts. We're going to do review. And for those of you who are like, man, that's just a lot of information. We will try mm -hmm. to break some of it down. And again, mm -hmm. if there's nothing uh, that, you know, there's no questions, uh, I will give you some of the things mm -hmm. that I talk about the first time. We, we'll we talk about some of the ways uh, we'll, on some of the things we learn on how to interpret the book of Revelation. Yes. Brendo, sometimes yes. I, want, I want to write down some of the information that you're presenting, but mm -hmm. you, move the, you move the screen too fast. <laughs> okay. So I'm really sorry. A, um, no, again, it's, it's one of those things. Mm -hmm. If you can kind of get take some notes, I, uh, I can always just bring out the the slides later on and okay. then can go through it on Sunday. That's what Sundays are for. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and, and uh, this is the thing. I try to go as fast as I can because I, I really want to be done in an hour. I understand. So, yes. Yeah. But okay. yeah, tomorrow um, we'll... Um, Go we'll over some okay. yeah, go through all yeah. of that. Yeah, thank you. It was a wonderful class. Mm -hmm. All right. Good to see y'all. All, all yeah. right. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay, thank good night. You. Bye, Bye. Bye, And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye